No, okay, perfect. So I'm going to map fluid state properties of bioforms to solid state using Bayesian optimization. So this is a very application uh, and experimental oriented uh, talk. And that's why I have samples. So basically I am talking about uh, these kind of bioforms that we made and uh, how to make it really easy to me to predict the properties of that before making the material. But first I like to motivate that um, we are drowning on plastics and sometimes the styrofoam like plastics end up in the sea and uh, there is going to be regulatory actions towards this. So we need to reinvent plastics. And it would be nice to create this fully forest-based, recyclable, non-toxic water-resistant uh, material with competitive production cost. And that's why we need some physics. So this is the kind of um, uh, setup that what we are kind of trying to optimize. So we have these road-like uh, elements and when these dry in the process, so you start from the wet state and you dry it, they shrink on the radial direction. And the bubbles are not allowed to relax or change neighbors. So the only way uh, what they can uh, accommodate this uh, drying or shrinkage is by elongating. And when they elongate, uh, the particles or the rod-like particles, so the forest-based fibers, they want to orient with the bubbles. So there is um, hydrophilic um, fibers that want to be in the water phase. And the best way they can do it is when they are, their major axis aligns with the bubbles. And now you start to have lots of lots of parameters. So how do you make the elongation, elongated bubbles? What kind of fibers you put in? What kind of length scales you have? What solvents you have and so forth. So the parameter space to explore is huge. So why do I want to orient the bubbles? Because it makes a really, really strong foam. So the, one of the goals in this project was that how much stronger we can make a foam in one direction compared to the other one. And uh, the best so far what we have is that it's 40 times stronger in the, uh, along the bubbles or along the fibers than uh, across the bubbles. So on the right-hand side figure is the stress versus strain or force displacement curve when you compress the foam and the blue blue block is much, much stronger than the green green block. And because I cannot call this aerogel as much as I want, I will call this a foamogel. And the idea is that um, we are now at the blue circle. So this is the strength versus density map. And we want to make a strong material as possible with the lowest weight. And the question is that how far we can go towards the theoretical maximum uh, of engineering materials. So now I have a kind of parameter space, I have a problem, and now I want to use minimal amount of work to reach that goal. But uh, to wake you up, I have a question for you. So out of all engineering materials, which material has the largest young modulus per price of cubic meter? So I can mix this, uh, this uh, purely physics uh, problem by adding price to the equation. And now I'm kind of trying to uh, fool you by showing very lightweight materials. And uh, the material that I'm looking for is actually very, very lightweight. You can see it on the roof. So we are talking about concrete. So the, um, this is not intuitively very obvious, but uh, the concrete is very, very cheap. And that makes it kind of the strongest or the uh, kind of the elastic modulus is the best uh, compared to the volume and the price. And so this is um, when you start to do these kind of things, there are these uh, areas that you don't really intuitively look for. And this is exactly what kind of space we want to explore. And this reminded me when I heard about this minimum energy states of hollow pyramids. So there are structures that are really strong uh, and uh, they are not intuitively clear. So is it possible to speed up the process of finding these extremes? And the process what I'm trying to optimize is that first 
I have to choose the ingredients. Then I have to choose the concentrations. I have to prepare the suspensions. I have to solidify the foam and then make the measurement. And what do we actually measure? So we have a kind of preparation stage where there are material properties. So there are um, mass of the particles, molar mass. Then we can put some weird uh, parameters like price or degree of substitution. So basically that how pure is the material, it rises the price, but it makes it more efficient to actually make the foam. Then when we make a suspension out of it, uh, it goes into fluid state. So we have rheological measurements. So basically now I have a fluid in a cup. I put the piston in the center and rotate and measure the force. And I get para, uh, measurables like viscosity, loss modulus, storage modulus. And then I dry the foam. I go into the solid state when, when we, I have mechanical properties. And these are the Young's modulus, density, yield, strength, and so forth. So, um, so how, I, how can I can spend least amount of labor and find what is the largest possible specific strength and which what material. So now I try to explain how this thing works. So we our data cube is, has 11 dimensions. So basically we have we have one one measurement, one set of parameters, and then we make 11 measurements, and some of them include the uh, parameters of the material. I put it in a re machine readable table. I take some algorithm. Here we use Gaussian process regression. Uh, we make the regression of this item 11 dimensional data. And then we try to plot it in a human readable format. This is somewhat uh, successful. Um, but then we can ask the algorithm to, what is the location of greatest uncertainty? Okay, that works. And then we make a measurement to lower that uncertainty. Yes, it works. And then we, what we are currently doing is that uh, where should I measure to next to find the material that, for example, has the highest yield strength? So basically, um, in other words, we, are, we have a surrogate function that is a Gaussian process regressor. Uh, it uses radial basis functions. Then we create an acquisition function from that. And then we evaluate that what is the next measurement point that we want to measure. And then we iterate this process. Uh, here is in uh, 2D. So basically now here we optimize the jellification temperature as a function of uh, Benesil concentration, which is one of our uh, kind of uh, materials that we make the foam out of. So basically what we do is that uh, we want to first, we take a point and we calculate how much it decreases the uncertainty of our other measurements. And then we repeat this for the all the points in our parameter space. And then we pick one that uh, lowers the uncertainty the most. And in the graphics, we start from the low and we add a point, we update the acquisition function, we add the point, we update the acquisition function and so forth. So we make a measurement. So the computer suggests us a new measurement that makes us our life easier. And now if we want to go into the uh, topic that we have fluid state parameters and we want to optimize Young's modulus. So here on the X and uh, so the X and Y, we have a uh, fluid state parameters of stor storage modulus and jellification temperature, what we measure in the fluid state. And then we want to optimize the Young's modulus in the uh, third dimension. And this is a kind of semi-manual process that we first made um, a bunch of points. And then we start adding points um, kind of uh, based on what kind of uh, uh, surrogate function we got. And uh, the idea was here that we make uh, this fully automated. Now this was a semi-automated process. And when we follow this path, we actually find a very good, uh, that we increased significantly the Young's modulus for this. And then of course, now it's uh, is suggesting uh, us a new point that is next next to that point that we are not at the best one. So we need to test more. So this is a continuous process uh, to optimize the, to finding the optimum. And uh, if you're wondering why not all the points are in the same, same plane or the fit is not perfect, it's because there is eight other dimensions and we kind of uh, can replace difficult experiments with a simple one. So if we don't want to use the same parameters, we can still 
uh, do the same process in 11 dimensions. And now we end up in this problem that how should I kind of visualize this that makes sense. So basically I have to somehow map all the points in the same surface to make it look nice. But the next step is then that uh, now we had the fluid state. So, um, and it's suggesting that next I need, should do a measurement with the jellification temperature of 45 degrees. Uh, how do I do that? Well, I can repeat the process and then I can do the, exactly the same thing. Uh, but now I use my parameters are oh, the measure, uh, materials that I put in. So this works exactly the same way. So now I have two, two com components there. So I have the Stura cell and Bene cell, which are the kind of main components. And now I want to optimize that. How do I get the uh, jellification temperature of 45 degrees? And there is now a line that I can uh, circle. Uh, I can take any con concentration that gives me a jellification temperature of uh, 45 degrees. And I should, if I use that, I would get a higher um, Young's modules in a solid state. But, and also here, there is a problem now that we have this local maximum that is somewhere there, but uh, this one also has the highest uncertainty. So our algorithm is suggesting that maybe we should make um, another measurement there to make uh, the estimate better. So next steps. So we are going to generate a lot more experimental data. We are going to put it online somehow for everybody to use. One, one uh, idea is this AMAD system. Then we are going to build this automated high throughput rheometer. So basically this generates suspensions based on what the computer suggests and makes the measurement automatically over and over again. So basically it's making a mixture and making a rheological measurement and putting it online. That's the goal. Um, and the uh, goal is to find optimal strength per weight with the least amount of uh, experiments uh, made by humans. And also we want to add process parameters. So this is a kind of industrial uh, direction that if we want to kind of um, optimize factories to kind of mimic from the lab scale machine to the big pilot machines and to the factories. So to conclude, so this, um, so this framework that I presented, it works very well with this rheological data. It's a uh, rather straightforward to use. And then we can use it to online predict that what are the material parameters. And we can pro predict the properties of the material before these materials are even made. And uh, these properties of the wet state, they actually indicate very well the properties of the dry state as well. And then what we are going to do next with this algorithms is that we want to improve uh, this, how to find a maximum or how to find the extremums of the uh, properties, especially this strength per weight ratio. Thank you. Questions, um, Joachim. Hi, um, is it working? Yeah, okay. really close. Okay, uh, thank you for the nice uh, talk. Um, it's, uh, I, I recognize this. <laughs> I feel like I've done this. Uh, <laughs> So for the acquisition function, you said you were using expected improvement, but you said that you're, but you're focusing on, on reducing the uh, variance. Uh, maybe I'm missing something, but the way, the way I learned it is that with the expected improvement, you're mainly trying to improve, uh, like find an extremum. And then you would usually add like an extra term to your expected improvement function. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was a bit unclear. So uh, we started by kind of making our um, experiment more reliable. And then we, at some point we shifted to kind of uh, finding the extremums. So uh -huh. we modified the, yeah, that part wasn't. Okay. Yeah, so you started yeah. kind of doing exploration yes, yes, yes. and then, yeah. Yeah. So, yes, exactly. That makes sense. Why not? Hey man, um, <clears throat> nice talk. Uh, so I'm, I'm really curious about the rheological data. Um, what exactly is the ideal rheological profile of the wet solution um, that would give you like the optimal Young's modulus? Um, okay, so let's see if I 
have it here. So basically, um, this is um, this is how how it behaves as a function of temperature. So uh, so basically, what we are looking for is that uh, the storage modules, so the uh, the how do you call it? The spring constant is much more uh, larger than the loss modulus or the viscosity, and uh, um, so that makes basically the perfect foam in this case for these parameter uh, fibers that we have tested. And yeah, so it has to be really viscous and really uh, elastic. Really viscous, really elastic. Um, shear thinning behavior. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, I don't have a, fig a figure of that, but yeah, it's non uh, non Newtonian, uh, and uh, shear thinning is the yeah. Yeah. So I'm um, just really curious. I mean, in your last slide, you mentioned that you were trying to look, find some kind of an online process yep. for in situ characterization of the rheology. Um, any idea how that would how much of how a design like that would be? Um, so so this is um so we have this application that basically the, we we are making this this in the, in here in Odaniemi. And basically, we have an uh, online database of all the parameters. So basically, what we want to do is that we want to run the machine that produces this based on um, some measurables that um, we get, and it's uh, optimized, kind of updated automatically. And um, basically, that we measure the fluid state, and then when the machine produces the uh, the foam. Then we crush it and then measure the strength that how much we use to crush it and then optimize the fluid again. Uh -huh. So that's the ultimate goal. And <laughs> but first we start with the easy one that we just use the real meter and uh, suspensions. But in principle, you could run uh, run some kind of process with this. Okay. Yeah, because I think that would be a bit of a challenge trying to get the rheological profiles of the liquid, you know, as it, as it moves through a capillary. Mm, yeah. Yeah. No. Um, last one. Uh, sorry. Um, do you mind if you comment a little bit on the biodegradability of the foam and exactly what you envision the first applications are going to be? First applications. Um, so the so the foam. So this is a, designed to be a styrofoam replacement. So this is going to be a packaging material, um, and I think that uh, this is um, impact protection of various uh, style of places where you use styrofoam. So, and um, there is one, there is some pilot starting with this, um, this sector design who is using it as uh, for their lamps to protect them during shipping. Uh, yes, and edible. So non-toxic and biodegrades in water. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Okay, one more question. Uh, thank you. It seems like a fascinating material. Um, you were comparing it to the price of concrete. Shouldn't you be comparing it to the price of styrofoam? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so the concrete was uh, just a kind of a example of um, something that you could uh, don't think about as a kind of a strong material um respect to weight and price um so the price um so at the moment this is um roughly roughly what what could i say this is uh, 10 times uh, more expensive than styrofoam but if you do this as a process uh, then it's uh, one to one with um, cardboard and then if, if you add styrofoam tax this is cheaper so there is a tax in plastic so which increases the price price of all oil-based products, so. Let's thank the speaker again. And for the last talk today, we have another industry